My name is Chris Vanderweg with Bardic Insights. Today we will be discussing one of the most prominent deities of mythology. Today we will be examining Odin of Norse mythology. I'd like to go on record that I am aware that some of these are pronounced very differently in their native tongue, and with that I want to clarify that Old Norse does not sound like Scandinavian. This is kind of like how we imagine Old English sounds these days, but it's quite different from the actual language spoken during the Elizabethan era. All that being said, I want to apologize ahead of time for anything that I may pronounce incorrectly. Alright, so we have Odin, Othan, the leader of the Aesir. And other translations have him listed as Wothan, Wotan, or Woden, but the oldest of these on record is Wothanaz, which translated has to deal with ecstasy brought upon by drink. There's a significant importance to this, but we'll come back to that a little later. Once Wothanaz's name was brought over into Old Norse, it was translated as Othan. So this is the translation that a Scandinavian Viking would have called him, and is therefore the translation that I'm going to try and use for this video. As for other names, well, how can I put this? One of Othan's aliases is Grimnir, which means shadow face. And that's pretty appropriate given that he has over 200 aliases. I know I've got 20 minutes to fill, but sorry, I'm not touching that. Othan is often depicted as a tall yet elderly figure with a great long gray beard. He is depicted wearing a winged helm and golden armor. However, when in the guise of the Wanderer, he wears a broad-rimmed floppy hat along with a blue-gray cloak. He only has one eye said to be blazing as the sun. Hmm, old guy, long beard, wanderer, broad-rimmed hat, gray cloak, really wise. If this description sounds anything like Gandalf from Lord of the Rings, it probably isn't a coincidence. As a Tolkien buff, I would be remiss not to take the opportunity to say that Tolkien borrowed very heavily from Germanic folklore, and the name of Gandalf in Old Norse translates to meaning Magic Elf, or Magic Using Elf. Anyway, back to Othan. He is also seen carrying his spear Gunnir, which never misses its target. He is the keeper of the magical ring Dropnir, whose magic allows for it on every ninth day to create eight identical rings. He is seen with numerous animal familiars. There is his eight-legged horse Sleipnir, two wolves by the names of Gerie and Freke, whom eat Othan's food, since he will only partake in wine, as well as two ravens named Hugin, Thought, and Munin, Memory, who will report back to Othan the goings-on in the world. Othan is seen as a god of magic, wisdom, and wit and learning, but he is also seen as a god of war and of bloodshed. While Tyr is seen as a chivalrous war god, Othan is seen more as a victor by way of guile and cunning. His devious nature is probably steeped in the factor that he wants to instigate wars in order for strong warriors to die so that they will be able to join him when he is to lead the charge at the Battle of Rognorok. Socially speaking, Othan was also the patron deity of the political hierarchy. This primarily stemmed from the factor that at the top tier were the ruling class who valued wisdom. Second would be the warriors who looked to Thor, and third were farmers who would pray to Freuer in hopes of a bountiful harvest. In spite of this, Odin was also the patron of outlaws, most likely due to his cardinal attribute being a nonconformist attitude that rewarded cunning. So it's time for a little family tree knowledge, and yes, that is an Yggdrasil joke. I'm going to go fast because this isn't really about Othan and more about where he comes from. So... In the beginning, there was Gnungaga, or the Yawning Void. To one side of the void was Nivelheimer, which was cold, and to the opposite was Muspel, which was hot. Located in Nivelheimer was a spring or a well of water called Huelgemir. As the frozen waters of Huelgemir would travel across the void closer to Muspel, they would thaw, and as they would drip, they would form rivers. It is from this water that the first creation is Ymir, the giant, that would emerge. Second was Ahumala, who was a primeval cow. She then licked the ice of Genungaga 
and this brings about Buri. Buri would later give birth to Bor, and Bor would marry Bestla, and they would have three sons, Vili, Ve, and Uthan. So the first task of this merry band of brothers is to kill Emir, and they use his corpse to really get the creation kind of kicked off. They use his flesh to make the earth, his teeth become the rocks, bones become the mountains, Emir's brains are thrown into the sky for the clouds, eyelashes become a fence. It's really quite the list, but this is how we'd get Midgard, or Midgathir, or Earth, the dwelling place of man, elves, and dwarves. There's more to this creation mythology, but again, I'm going to skip over a lot, since it is supposed to be more about Othan right now. After this comes the creation of Osgardir, or Asgard, which is connected to Earth by way of the Bifrost, the Rainbow Bridge. Bet you Dorothy was glad she didn't end up there. Osgardir is where the home of the gods is located, and this is called Valhol, as many of you know it, Valhalla. Here, Othan presides over those who die in battle with his aides, the Valkyria, or the Valkyries. Returning to another name for Othan, we get the Allfather, a suitable title given the number of prominent children he is dad to. Before I go into the list, I want to say that there are a number of gods and figures attributed to Othan as their father, and in various versions some are listed as his children, other times not so much. For the purpose of this video, I'm going to be sticking to those with a strict parentage. So. Othan marries Frigg, and together they have two sons named Baldr and Hothir, by the way of Jorth, a gigantus, and possibly the personification of Earth, he is the father of Thor. I'm not sure how Ymir's skin became the Earth, and then it became Jorth, so please don't read too much into this. She isn't even really mentioned much beyond being the mother of Thor anyway. Othan, at some point, is said to have also had relations with Grith, a Jotun, or giant, to sire Vithair, who shall avenge Othan's death at Ragnarok. Another Jotun that Othan beds is Reinthir, who would give birth to Vali. Vali would go on to kill Hothir in vengeance for what happens to Baldir. Othan would also have an affair with Gunnuloeth, one uh, that doesn't really result in any children, but whether she loves him or not is hard to say, depending the version of the story. One son, whom we have an account of, but no mother, is Mile, who is listed as brother to Thor and Baldr. Similarly, Hermod refers to Baldr as his brother, but we have no indication of his mother or how he was sired by Othan. Mm. Othan was always questing for more knowledge, and in repeated accounts, it looks like he's willing to go to whatever lengths necessary to get it. Earlier, when we mentioned that Othan only had one eye, the account of the loss of his depth perception stemmed from a trade he had to make in return for knowledge. As the tale begins, Othan is awaiting the return of his ravens, Hugin and Munin, who typically tell Othan what's going on. They return late and seem to inform Othan that things... Well, they're not looking too good. Othan gets depressed before Frigg tells him that they should seek counsel from the Norns. The Aesir go to see the Norns, and Othan learns from Skuld that things are indeed pretty bleak. Deciding that the world of Midgathir is going to need some serious help, he decides to seek a drink from the well of Mimir. Traveling to Jothenheim, the realm of the giants, Othan draws on his disguise of the Wanderer, and there he is able to meet the wisest of the giants, Vafthrufnir. Othan seeks to question Vafthrufnir for what he knows of Mimir and the well, but he knows that any who seek the giant's knowledge must wager their own head in a contest of knowledge. Should Othan win, he keeps his head and may kill Vafthrufnir, and if Vafthrufnir wins, he will take Othan's head. Given Othan's age, he is able to successfully answer all of the giant's questions, and when it comes time to ask his own, he kind of pulls a sneaky move and asks a question that only he knows the answer to. 
You know, going back to Tolkien, I'm getting a very distinct Bilbo, Gollum, Riddles in the Dark kind of throwback moment here. Anyway, so Vafthrufnir can't answer the question, and in return for his life being spared, will answer whatever it is that Othan wishes to learn. Othan asks what Mimir will want in return for drinking from the Fountain of Knowledge. Vafthrufnir explains that Othan will be asked to give up his right eye in exchange for a sip of the water. At first, this answer really gets to Othan, and he has some hesitation in going through with the trade. But taking a look around, he sees the threats that everyone will be facing at the time of Ragnarok. So he finally goes to Mimir and makes the trade. This wouldn't be the only time that Othan would make such an offering, though. After he had made the trade of his eye for knowledge, later on he speaks to his son Vithair about how in the past he hung himself from Yggdrasil in order to gain wisdom. The tale describes that Othan saw that the Norn could use runes to affect the nine worlds. They did this by etching them into Yggdrasil, the world tree, and this allowed their powers to spring forth and go out among the worlds. Othin, in an effort to make a sacrifice worthy of this power, stabbed himself with Gunnir and hung himself from the tree. A little thing to note here is that Ygir, Ygir is one of Othin's aliases, and Drasil can be translated as horse, so the tree could be called Othin's horse since he hung or rode it. Othan ends up hanging from the tree in a near-death-like state for nine days. Nine is the quintessential important number of Norse culture. During this time, he refuses the aid of any of the Aesir and would not partake of food or water. The runes eventually revealed themselves to him and give him access to more power. From a mythical standpoint, runes were more than just writing and the alphabet. They were believed to give control over the aspects of life that they symbolized, things such as healing, protection, shape-changing, etc. It's kind of important to note that some scholars believe that the, quote, sacrifice was based not just on the abstract loss of time and temporary suffering that Othan went through, but supposedly he actually did give up a part of himself, what that part is is kind of hard to tell, but there seems to be a reoccurring theme that there is the giving up of one's lesser self to achieve a higher state of being, so maybe that's what this represents? It isn't stated 100% if this is before or after he gave up his eye, but due to the wording in one portion of the Edda where Othan says, I may change my knowledge to wisdom, it's possible that this could be hearkening to the concept that wisdom is the proper use of knowledge, and if he gained knowledge by the well of Mimir, this would help him to now know how to use said knowledge. But then again, the Edda also has him say that the runes appeared before his eyes, and if he only had one, that might be wrong. I'm by no means a translations expert, so please go easy on me with that one. Mind you, there is a lot more to Othan's myths that I haven't even touched on. Heck, there's even a whole poem of wisdom in the Edda that includes his recommended etiquette on how to attend to travelers. If you're interested, you can go look it up, but I just can't bring myself to go into that level of detail at this time. Oh, you remember earlier when we said that the root name for Othan was Wothanaz? Well, the English variant was Woden or Weden, and this is how we get the name of the week, Weden's Day, or Wednesday. Hmm, guess that the name now being associated with Hump Day, it would seem pretty logical it can also get associated with the ecstasy brought upon by drink, as in the original translation of the name. Actually, though, there is even more to the cultural significance behind that name other than getting drunk. One of the most iconic warriors of history, the Berserker, or Berserker, were attributed to Othan because of their seeming invulnerability to fire and iron. Recent studies have been looking into a suggestion from 1784 that attribute this trademark wild fighting style and seeming immunity to pain that it might have been caused by a hallucinogenic mushroom mead that the warriors would partake of before battle. 
So, yeah, nothing like getting high on shrooms to go into war, and no wonder you don't feel any pain or fear. It's interesting to note that the root author can be leaned both towards the words ecstasy and fury, given that it was more about a mental state. Regardless of the cause of the frenzied state, Othan's association with the Berserker may also be the source of his nickname, Oathbreaker. This might have been attributed to a Berserker paying homage to him to go into battle, only to afterwards feel the pain of their injuries and feeling like, Othan has forsaken me and taken away my immunity, when it was the adrenaline and maybe the drugs wearing off. It could also be just given how fickle he might have been. I want you to win this war. No, I want you to die in this war and join me in Valhol. Eh, that could get pretty taxing. That brings us to Methods of Worship. And oh boy, hold on to your broad-rimmed hats, because this does get just a bit dark. In Sweden, what is currently known as Sigtuna, there was a place called Gamla Uppsala. It was here that there was a temple that was erected. The place of worship is said to have been covered in gold and held the statues of three gods. Thor, in the middle, wielding a mace, or possibly a scepter, Othan to the side with weapons and armor, and Freuer with, well, um, his manhood. Anywho. Though Thor was the most sacrificed to, there were offerings made to Othan in times of war, and Freuer for marriage. Now, we don't know with absolute certainty if the following is true, but there is an account written by Adam of Bremen who describes in rather vivid detail about how every nine years there were massive festivals held, during which times nine members of nine different species are said to have been sacrificed, including humans and horses. Due to the story of Othan hanging himself on Yggdrasil, one common ritualistic sacrifice seems to have been by way of hanging an animal or man from the trees in the forest nearby and delivering a spear wound to them. Frequently, it is also attested that a human would be thrown into a well, and if they did not re-emerge, it was seen that the sacrifice had been acceptable to the gods. While again, we don't know for certain if the accounts written by Adam are true or not, there have been remains found of humans who were tossed into Viking wells, which does lend support to Adam of Bremen's description of the sacrificial accounts being true. So, just so we don't end on a downer note here, and since nine is the important number in Norse mythology, I just thought we should end with a list of nine actors who have portrayed Odin in assorted media. W. Morgan Shepard, Disney's Gargoyles of 1996. Peter McCauley, Hercules, The Legendary Journey, 1998. Alexander Peterson, Xeno Warrior Princess, 2000. Bob Hoskins, Son of the Mask, 2005. A character by the name of Ryuto Asamiya takes the title of Odin in Kenichi the Mightiest Disciple. He is voiced by Ken Narita in Japanese and Jerry Jewell in English from the year 2007. Duncan Frazier, Supernatural, 2010. Anthony Hopkins, Marvel's Thor movie, 2011 and Eddie Drew in the TV show Vikings, 2013. Well, that about does it for me. Thank you for listening, and I'll now send you back over to your regularly scheduled hostess. Good evening, morning, afternoon, fellow subscribers or watchers. I am Liz the T-Rex, and first off, I want to say thank you for taking the time to watch this video. And I also want to give a quick shout out and thank you to KK from Bardic Insight. He was very kind enough to lend me his voice this time around. Along with Yami HP7, she is the artist that does the artwork for these videos specifically. Speak, um, both of their links will be in the description below, so be sure to check out their 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 social media pages and give them a like or follow. 
I have a couple of announcements for you guys, but first, before I get into that, I want to say I'm sorry for the late upload. I know I said I was going to try and get these up on Monday. There was a bit of a last minute change and we decided to try something different so that we can get a feel for what we're aiming for with the series. So if you liked it, if you like this version of it, please be sure to leave a comment saying what you like, what you didn't like. If you didn't like it, tell us why. Tell us if you liked the other one, the video before this one. So we can fix stuff, you know, adjust it, try and make it even more entertaining for you guys to watch or listen. Um, first things first, the Yanus shirts, the, those are officially off of Teespring. They will not be back for a while, so I'm sorry if you missed out on those, but that means that you should definitely subscribe so that you know when they go up again. Hey, okay, see, benefits there. Um, that video, I'm going to say, did really well the first week. I didn't expect for it to get that much traffic within the first week, but I am definitely happy with what it did. Um, we did reach the five like goal that I asked for. So this time around for the Odin video, I'm going to say, let's try and reach that 10 likes. Maybe you think that's a good, I think that's a good number. Nice and fair. Um, also be sure to hit that subscribe button on your way out. You know, I, mean, I know I already said that, but you know, hit the button so that you know. The Odin shirts are officially up and they will be available until January 15th. So if you're interested, you should really go and buy those, you know, before they're gone forever, gone for a while, not forever. I mean, depends, depends on how old this channel does. And, um, have a nice day. So, goodbye.